Welcome to Health Hackers episode 50. If you have clicked on this episode because optimizing your dental health is something you want to know more about, you have come to the right place. But I want to make you aware that what you're about to hear is probably going to be a little different from the kind of information you may have previously heard when it comes to looking after your teeth, your mouth, and the impact on the rest of your body. Today's special guest is a functional dentistry expert, Dr. Mark Behenna, aka Dr. B, the creator of AskTheDentist.com and author of The Eight Hour Sleep Paradox. Dr. B spent 35 years as a dentist seeing patients here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And if you follow him on social media at AskTheDentist, you'll be familiar with his microbiome first approach to dental health. Dr. B is big on prevention and fixing the root cause of a problem using lifestyle modifications. After all, as Dr. B says, the best dentistry is no dentistry. Before we begin, a quick note to new Health Hackers viewers and listeners. Anything you hear or see on Health Hackers should not be considered personal or medical advice. You know the score. Always talk to your health provider about your concerns. Now, welcome to Health Hackers, Dr. B. Hi, Gemma. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So tell us more about this microbiome first approach to dental health. What does it mean? And are we talking about the gut microbiome or the oral microbiome? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for the intro. Uh, I like how you say microbiome first. That's something we've never really used in any of our blogging or marketing. But yeah, it is. It, it has to be first. Uh, the, the thinking in dentistry, and it's not, as you said in your introduction, it's not all different, but a lot of it is. I don't want it to sound too ominous, uh, but in my dental education, there were a lot of things that I learned that I know now through clinical practice, but also through reading studies and, and you know, uh, the future of new research and all that, that things are different and that you may be seeing a dentist that has that old way of thinking. And uh, if you don't put the oral microbiome first and you, for example, are being shamed by your dentist or your hygienist, about not flossing and brushing or maybe eating too many sweets. I mean, that's, it's just, that's not the full picture. So a functional dentist, someone who thinks about the big picture is going to tell you that the oral microbiome should be first. So everything you do should be geared towards optimizing the oral microbiome. And of course, we've heard this before. We've heard it with the gut. It should be nothing new, although the oral microbiome is kind of always pushed aside because it's probably just something like a biome of the skin or the of the armpit it's minor it's not it it's linked to the gut microbiome it's a it's a big influencer so yeah gut microbiome uh, oral microbiome first is a great way to look at it and what do you mean by microbiome first so for example um you know, we're, we go to see the dentist and we're told, oh, you know, you, you have a few cavities, you have some gum disease, and this is really maybe about diet, eating the wrong foods, and not brushing and flossing enough. And it's the gut microbiome and the oral microbiome together that are uh, very uh, important for supporting your immune system. So the oral microbiome has an immune system. It's trying to prevent infections from getting into your mouth. I mean, the mouth is something that opens. It's very vulnerable. The gut is a little bit more tucked away. And there are a lot of bacteria, and these bacteria are not all of ours. They are typically uh, alien DNA, you can call it. We are a super organism. These are bacteria that are not human, and they are commensal, and they live in us, and together we make up the super organism that is able to function well. Uh, we have been upsetting this oral microbiome with diet, with poor sleep, with mouth breathing, all these external factors, um, brushing and uh, rinsing with the wrong mouthwashes, and we've been trying to knock down the oral microbiome. We've been trying to kill and disinfect these bugs in our mouth, and of course, don't feel bad, you, you're taking the advice of dentistry. Dentistry, um, if you do a, a search on the link between gum disease and um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, the first link, the first hit you'll see is an ad, and it's for Listerine. And in, in big, bold words, it says, disinfect your mouth and prevent Alzheimer's. I mean, and, and that is not the right way to see things. This oral microbiome is responsible for preventing uh, Alzheimer's. So again, we have this, these series, of billions of bugs in our mouth. Some of them are human and uh, they're working together with these other bugs. It can be a yeast cell, it can be uh, 
fungi, it can be many, many different things. If we upset that oral microbiome, which is easy to do, and we can talk more about that, then you start getting cavities, you start getting gum disease, uh, bad breath, for example. Um, but also, all these oral diseases are connected to systemic diseases. And you can get other diseases. You can, get, uh, you can have a propensity towards insulin resistance, which leads later to, uh, to diabetes. Uh, you can actually get uh, Alzheimer's if you don't control, not control, but maintain and nourish this oral microbiome. So it's a bunch of bugs in our body. And it's not just the gut. It's not other microbiomes. It's also the oral microbiome. So it's, it's important. I just want to go back to what you said about Alzheimer's. That's a, a, a big statement. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't have heard about that before. Are there proven links between oral health and Alzheimer's you can tell us about? Absolutely. There are studies. Um, they're pretty new, so don't feel bad if you haven't heard about it. Um, there's this oral systemic connection, and we've known about it for a while. In dental school 35 years ago, I was told to give an antibiotic to a patient if they have, for example, a pig valve, uh, some foreign, a foreign substance in their body that was put in you know, via surgery, because we knew that the bacteria, after a simple cleaning or another procedure that involved bleeding in the mouth, I remember a cleaning does in, involve bleeding in the mouth, which we refer to as a bacteremia, these bacteria get into the blood supply, into your bloodstream, and they can settle out on that pig valve and cause a super infection. Well, now we call it the oral systemic connection. The mechanism is probably threefold. It's probably multifactorial. It's, it, it happens via infection, injury, inflammation. The bugs in your mouth, whether they're good bugs or bad bugs, they actually uh, end up in all these tissues, including the brain. And the latest studies show that the amyloid plaque protein, the tau protein, that that, that essentially is not the cause of Alzheimer's, which we used to think 10, 20 years ago, but it's actually a sign that something is happening. And now we know what causes that. It is a reaction from the immune system, from a oral bacterium that gets from the mouth via this other substance called the gingipan. It gets into the bloodstream, which happens all the time. Uh, if you cut yourself in the mouth from eating a tortilla chip, or if you go see a dentist and get a cleaning done, these bacteria can get into the bloodstream. It's transient, it lasts 20 minutes. Um, if you have gum disease in the mouth, it can be there constantly, getting past very thin tissues in the mouth into the bloodstream. And then they cross the blood brain barrier and the brain sees this and it starts laying down this amyloid plaque protein. And I mean, that's the beginnings of Alzheimer's. So there, there is a known link now between oral bacteria, gum disease, poor oral health, a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome, which is essentially kind of covers it all, uh, and, and Alzheimer's. And I mean, they have, for example, in these studies, um, they've given the P. gingivalis bug, which we all have in our mouths, whether we're healthy or not. It's really a matter of, is this bug pathogenic because the mouth is a mess, there's a dysbiosis, the bacteria are all at control and they're in the wrong ratio, ratios to each other? Or is it a healthy ratio where the gingivalis bug is not very strong? But th so mice were given this P. gingivalis and in six weeks started showing signs of a brain infection. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing. Um, they later showed signs of, of brain infection and deterioration and dementia. And that's, they do, they do um, post-mortem, you know, biopsies and I mean, there is a link now between gum disease and Alzheimer's. It's very clear. In fact, it's so clear, and you always know that, that these studies are pretty strong when the pharmaceutical companies are coming out and talking about coming out with a medication that will suppress this gingipan, and of course, it'll be the cure for Alzheimer's. So it's, it's that much of a causative link. We will come on to asking you for some steps we can take to have our healthiest oral microbiome possible. Just before we get to that, I want to ask you, how, how much can you tell about a person's health? Like what else can you tell from just from looking inside their mouth? A, a lot. Uh, it's, it's surprising. And, and, you know, as a young dentist coming out of school, I didn't know a lot of this. And then over time, you learn and you make these associations and then you read the studies about the links, this oral systemic link. So it's really important that you're seeing a dentist that can make these links. Uh, there are links between sleep, 
uh, we, we talked about Alzheimer's, of course, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, uh, diabetes, even cancer. So there, we, we can see from a conversational distance, a dentist can see inflammation. Uh, we can't help but see the texture, the morphology, the color of the gums, whether there's gum recession. Um, we can see grinding. This is all, again, still conversationally. Um, we can see signs of bruxing, grinding, which leads us to believe that there could be some connection to sleep issues. Uh, the bleeding gums, of course, would be uh, any kind of infection, inflammation in the body. It could be rheumatoid arthritis. Also, GERD. I mean, once we get into the mouth, we can see the signs of GERD. Um, you know, erosion to the teeth, uh, blanching of the tissue. Um, so good being an acid reflux issue. Exactly, exactly. Um, which is associated with sleep as well. We, we can actually, we, there are many things, it's usually morphology, color, texture, shape, architecture of the face, facial dimensions, width of the maxilla, uh, tapering chin or square chin. I mean, profile, uh, we, we have all these measurements we take of someone's profile, especially if, you're, if, you're, if you've seen an orthodontist, uh, they measure all of this. And so scalloped tongue, geographic tongue, we can see nutritional deficiencies. So make sure you're seeing a dentist that can pick up on all this, because again, you're seeing your dentist way more often than you are seeing your, your general physician, your primary care physician. Is there a number one danger to our teeth that you think of? I know with you, it won't be sugar um, from what right. I've read about you. What, would, what do you believe to be the number one danger to our teeth? That's a great question. Uh, it, it depends on the person and their lifestyle. Uh, and that's something that as dentists, we look at. Um, so if you're not sleeping well, it, it, you're probably grinding your teeth at night. You're suffering from sleep bruxism. That can deteriorate your teeth and gums uh, via recession very, very quickly, within years. Um, where if you are eating a lot of you know, bad foods, carbohydrates, refined sugars, or even breads, refined breads, I mean, that'll eventually over a decade will lead to a lot of fillings, but that's not loss of tooth structure. Um, you know, gum disease is, is very uh, debilitating. It literally the body's eating away itself it, it's an inflammatory response and it's eating away at all the supportive tissues around the teeth the fibers that hold the teeth in the in the jawbone and all of that can be necrosed away through inflammation and that's loss of teeth that's not a good thing people that have missing teeth tend to live a shorter life we, we have documentation of that in studies so there are many ways to damage your teeth you can get into a car accident you can fall on your teeth you can you know, get into a bar fight. Um, I have patients that, that have done that. I mean, there are many ways to do that. The number one way I think would be, and this is underestimated, is diet, is the internal uh, nutrition in your body. If you're eating well, then your teeth are getting this, this nutrition via their own blood supply. Teeth are living. They have a blood supply and they have tissue inside of them. And I think a lot of yellowing occurs in people, I've noticed this, that have other systemic issues inflammatory conditions in their body. So, and that's just an acceleration of the aging process, free radicals and oxidation. And so I think the, the most underestimated way of damaging your teeth is just uh, eating poorly, uh, not having the right nutrition, not getting enough K2 and A and D3 and, and, and minerals. I mean, minerals are lacking in our diet. So, so, I mean, you can throw in grinding and cavities and poor diet from that. Those are all external factors, uh, breaking your teeth due to trauma but don't underestimate uh, poor nutrition. So what should we be eating then? What kind of diet did you recommend to your patients? Do, you know, if I don't have a lot of time, I'll just say paleo. Paleo is an optimal diet. I know that doesn't work for everyone, um, but you know, paleo is a pretty safe diet uh, because it is a diet of our ancestors. And, and if you look at the archeological records, uh, you'll see that our ancestors had good facial development. They had great open airways. Their mouths were closed when they weren't speaking, when they were sleeping. Uh, they ate well. Uh, they didn't have access to all this refined foods. They didn't have GMOs uh, in their diet. They didn't have pesticides. Um, they, they had a pure food supply and they really didn't have access to refined carbohydrates. And if you do that, you literally will not get any cavities. I mean, it's almost guaranteed. I think a lot of patients assume from being a child, and again, that's when you're imprinted upon, you start getting a lot of cavities, and you think, when I go to the dentist, 50-50 odds that I'm gonna have a, a cavity, and it doesn't need to be that way. 
That is not the norm. Um, and 60, 70% of us in this country have gum disease. That is, should not be the norm. Our ancestors did not have that. So eat our ancestors' diet. That is a simple question, a simple answer to your question. Um, if you want to pick it apart a little bit, there are certain foods, for example, beans. I'm not against beans. Beans have the phytic acid in it that can leach ca uh, calcium and phosphorus and magnesium out of your diet. You need those building blocks. You need them in your saliva. You need it in your blood to help produce strong teeth. So are you recommending beans? No. <laughs> You're not saying I don't diet. recommend beans, uh, but, but if you have... Yeah, in moderation, for, for example. I mean, I would be careful. I, the paleo diet is, is not big on beans, and that's one of the reasons. Um, but I, I get a lot of pushback on that. People like their beans. They think it's a very healthy food. There, there, there are not many nutrients in beans, but they are delicious. But if you do have beans, marinate them. Like in the Mediterranean diet, the Italians will marinate their beans. That takes out that phytic acid or lessens it. And what other steps? I mean, we've covered diet briefly there, but what other steps can people take or did you used to tell your patients to take in order to achieve the healthiest oral microbiome and therefore better health in general? Stay away from mouthwash. That We have studies that indicate that using a typical mouthwash, that actually will elevate your uh, blood pressure. It's killing off bugs that uh, in your mouth of the oral microbiome that are actually there to help you produce a lot of nitric oxide. So that's one example. Um, I'm not against brushing and flossing. Um, I just don't put it high on the list. For me, it's dry mouth, then it's diet, then it's brushing and flossing, and then it's these epigenetic factors. That's the the, the priority I have for uh, what causes oral oral diseases. So, so diet is important, but after diet, and let's face it, you know, when we go to someone's birthday, we're going to want to try a little bit of the birthday cake, perhaps, and and so brushing and flossing do have a place. Uh, if you have a dysbiosis you're gonna to have to maybe reset that oral microbiome and use a very strong mouthwash that kills off all the bad bugs that are, are in, you know, are, I mean, they are pathogenic. They are in the population. They are strong in the population. They are dominant is the word. And you don't want those bugs to be dominant. So how do you reset it? And that's controversial in dentistry. But using a mouthwash daily every morning, that's a big mistake. Using a toothpaste that has emulsifiers in it, um, uh, surfactants, things that disrupt the uh, mucosa. These are things that will break cell walls, which is not what you want. This mucosa on your cheek and the floor of your mouth, on your palate, it's one cell thick, it's very fragile, um, it's very permeable, it can be very leaky as well. That's how we take our homeopathic medications by putting something in the floor of your mouth and letting it seep uh, through into the bloodstream. So Toothpaste can disrupt all that and cause a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome. These things can actually give you bad breath and, and cause cavities. And so when you search for, you know, things like I have bad breath, what do I do? And you see these products come up, you have to be very wary. So, so it, it's very confusing to a lot of people, unfortunately. I bought a sodium bicarbonate mouthwash with 12 essential oils in it because it looked like a natural more gentle option uh, right. to a standard mouthwash and then i saw your warning about essential oils tell us why you're not a fan of those uh, i i can link you to a study on essential oils it depends on which essential oil some are very bactericidal uh they're as bad as any toothpaste uh colgate for example used to include triclosan which was a detergent um a soap uh, in their toothpaste and that was killing, disrupting these cells, but it, it's indiscriminate. It's killing all the good and bad bacteria. And that's the bad news. The good news is that the oral microbiome typically will recover, but it doesn't always recover that well over the, over the short term because the anaerobic bacteria tend to grow quicker and are a little bit more resistant to all, all of those you know, chemicals and toothpaste than are the aerobes. And we need this perfect balance between aerobe, aerobes and, and anaerobes. Um, and, and gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. So this bacteria, this population in our mouth is fragile. Um, so yeah, I would be careful of, I, I've had people actually come in with burns from very natural homeopathic um, integrative products uh, that claim they have no chemicals in them. So again, um, we need more science. We need more evidence-based 
uh, thinking when it comes to making these products. And so you really don't want to disinfect your mouth. So the, if you see a natural product and it's talking about disinfecting or helping, helping the oral microbiome, make sure it doesn't have anything in it that is bad for your mouth. The best toothpaste is a prebiotic and a probiotic with some minerals in it. These are the things that we are, that is needed in our mouth to help remineralize the teeth and keep it healthy. Yeah, I've heard you and I've seen you post about hydroxyapatite toothpaste. Mm -hmm. I have some of that too, um, because a lot of us are familiar with hearing fluoride is something that can really help our teeth when it's in our toothpaste. You prefer hydroxyapatite. Um, why is that? And how did you hear about it? Well, I heard about it uh, through uh, a, a study that came out of Japan. It's, it, it's, it's already, well, back then it was 10 years old, so it's, it's probably 12 years old now. And uh, this stuff's been around for a long time. It is the natural calcium um, building block that is in two structure already. And if you put it into the mouth and it mixes with the saliva and the pH is right and the, there's no dysbiosis, the oral microbiome is, is working well, the teeth love it. They grab this stuff and they rebuild themselves. Every time you have a meal, your teeth are demineralizing. Uh, that's a demineralization event. And while you're eating, there's uh, the pH drops in your mouth. And that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, if you're eating potato chips or a birthday cake, uh, it's worse. Um, but then the saliva neutralizes the mouth and the oral microbiome. It turns, into, turns towards remineralizing the teeth. Well, it needs building blocks for that. It needs magnesium, calcium, phosphorus. It needs a little boron. It needs all these things. So that happens to be a great building block. It's better than fluoride, I think, because fluoride has so many problems, uh, uh, ingestion of fluoride especially. But topical fluoride does work. It's that negative ion mineral, which is strong. And if it does incorporate into the tooth structure, it does make it more resistant to the subsequent acid attacks. But hydroxyapatite is, is, is a, a natural form of calcium that we already have in our teeth. It makes perfect sense to me. And, and there are plenty of studies. I, I think there are over 60, 70 studies on hydroxyapatite. The Europeans love it. Um, it's readily available now in the US finally, and in toothpaste that have very few chemicals in them. So I think it's a great product. And I know, I know it works for me because I have sensitive teeth. And if I stop using my hydroxyapatite toothpaste, within a week or two, that sensitivity comes back. How many times a day do you brush your teeth and how long for? Uh, I brush twice a day. I think it's more about when, we can talk about that. Uh, some people, don't get me wrong, but some people don't need to brush. Uh, there are very few of us. Um, uh, some people can brush once a day. Some people need to brush a lot, like after every meal. It depends on what they're eating. Of course, you can overbrush, you can overdo it, you can cause damage to your teeth. Um, I would say to be safe twice, twice a day, I brush when I wake up because the uh, biofilm may be a little thicker. Even though I'm mouth taping, the mouth is drier because there's no saliva flow at night. I mean, there's less saliva flow at night, that's normal. Um, and so just to kind of give the, the mouth kind of a good restart, I'll brush in the morning, that's before breakfast. It used to be that I thought after breakfast was important. I gave patients a hard time for brushing before breakfast, but I understand now that, that is probably a good thing to do. If you're intermittent fasting, my next meal would be lunch. Then maybe I would brush after lunch, but maybe not if I'm on the road. And then brushing after dinner, brushing before bed, I thought was important. But typically, if you have a good oral microbiome, you're sleeping well, you don't have a dry mouth, um, you've had dinner and it's been three or four hours, there's no need to brush before bed. Twice a day, I think, is fine. Wow, no need to brush before bed, depending no. on your diet. Well, okay. let's say you had a little snack after dinner, it had some refined carbs in it, uh, you drank a little alcohol, a glass of wine, that's gonna dry out your mouth. I mean, that's the thing, you have to ask yourself, is, is there the need to brush? And it depends on your lifestyle. And, and I know that's a complicated answer, and you see, a, if you have a good hygienist, they'll be able to answer all those questions. You kind of have to, kind of have to make that decision on the fly. But perfect diet, perfect lifestyle, once a day is probably fine. And why do you prefer to brush before breakfast instead of after? What changed your mind? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't change my mind often, but that was, that, was, uh, that was an important lifestyle change, I think. Your, your biofilm is very thick in the morning because of the lack of saliva at night. And again, the saliva glands shut down at night and that's, part, that's a normal part of sleeping. 
And so they haven't had that buffering effect. Saliva is where all the nutrients come from uh, in remineralization and curricular health. That's health of the dental pocket and the ligaments around the tooth. So it's good to salivate in the morning and brushing will help you salivate. Uh, a good glass of water, a uh, full glass of water in the morning first thing is very important as well because you haven't had any hydration since you went to bed. If you've slept seven to eight hours, your body needs that. And teeth need hydration, by the way. They can be damaged. They can yellow by continually being dehydrated. Um, so the reason I do that is because after a meal, let's say, you're, let's say you have kids and you teach them to brush after breakfast. Well, they're running off to school, so they're gonna brush right after that meal. It could have been some Cheerios. They literally are scraping away enamel. That acid attack is creating this little slurry layer of calcium because of the acid, the, the uh, lowering of pH in the, in the mouth due to the meal. Um, and because of that, you're literally scraping off some, uh, some tooth surface, some tooth material. So it's better to wait for a half hour. So why not brush before breakfast? Why not get that biofilm a little thinner, a little bit more refreshed, so that when the meal does come, it doesn't stick to that thick layer of biofilm. And not all biofilm, biofilm and plaque, that's essentially the same thing. Uh, dentists have been trained to think of plaque as a bad thing. We've been telling our patients, you gotta remove the plaque. You can remove the plaque. You can get your teeth polished with that little profi paste after you get your scraping teeth cleaning done, but it's, it comes back within 30, 40, 50 minutes. It is the skin of your teeth. It is the pellicle. Uh, it is there to protect your teeth and nourish the teeth. Biofilms are very difficult to get rid of, but you can have a good biofilm or you can have a bad biofilm. Is biofilm that kind of furriness that you can feel with your tongue sometimes? Right. Yes, absolutely. And so, I mean, the toothbrush w was in, not invented, but it was uh, made mainstream. I think it was after World War II or before World War II. A lot of the GIs, there was a lot of decay. Of course, that was because of our diet. We're eating a lot of corn, refined products. Um, and we needed healthy GIs. We needed healthy soldiers. So they Pepsodent and the government, they got together, they, they made toothpaste. And essentially, uh, we were told, the, I forget the marketing line, but it was feel the gleam or feel the gleam, you know, run your tongue over the teeth. And the difference between a thick biofilm having brushed with a mildly abrasive polishing paste, which is what toothpaste started out to be and still is in many cases, um, you can feel that difference. And I think we're conditioned to think, well, that's a good thing. So in the morning, you're going to feel that your biofilm is a little thicker. I, call, I use the word furrier. Um, and so you can, I mean, you will notice that if you eat a bagel as opposed to some kind of raw broccoli and cauliflower with some olive oil, you will feel within 10 to 15, 20 minutes after those two different meals, a different biofilm. Uh, and if you really pay attention, you can make that decision on whether you should brush or not based on what you're feeling on your teeth. Okay. I eat a lot of fermented foods and while I understand that they are beneficial for us, I feel like um, they must be quite acidic in my mouth. Right. Yeah. Are they, is, is that harmful for my oral microbiome? That's a, that's a really good question. When we've, we've talked about this on our website about, for example, kombucha, which is a health drink, and they are slightly acidic, but the bacteria and the fermentation, I mean, fermented foods are fantastic. Uh, sauerkraut is an excellent food. As long as you're not brushing right after you eat these foods, you'll be fine. Yeah, sometimes when I'm eating sauerkraut, I actually feel a, a sensitivity tingle. in my mouth. Exactly, yeah. right. I mean, that is, that is you're, you're feeling that on the root surfaces of your teeth, um, and it's, it's the acid. It's the lowered pH that you're feeling on your teeth, and that's okay, but a lot of people will brush their teeth right afterwards, and you're literally brushing away a significant amount of enamel, even some dentin. A lot of that may remineralize, but it's not a good time to be brushing. Again, brushing, our ancestors didn't brush. Uh, they did have fermented foods and, and they did fine. So after eating something sugary or acidic or fermented, mm -hmm. uh, how long should someone wait until they brush their teeth? And should they rinse with water first? That's a great idea. So uh, for example, coffee drinkers, I get this asked a lot, I get asked this a lot. Um, it is acidic. You could, the same applies to kombucha, to wine. It can be, of course, sauerkraut. Um, it, it's good to rinse with water. The Europeans, when they drink wine, uh, they usually have mineral water. Uh, I don't see Americans doing that as much. That mineral water is a buffer. 
and uh, you can swish a little bit if you want with just a water. You can get a high pH water if you want. Maybe that helps a little bit more, makes it, uh, makes it a quicker uh, kind of equalization of the pH, but it's a good idea to do that, absolutely. Um, when I had braces uh, as an adult, uh, I didn't go in there and brush after a meal. Uh, that, that would have been a disaster. That would have called, caused decalcification along the bracket forms. Um, I would rinse with a lot of water. I would sit there in private and swish with water just to break everything apart and to neutralize the acids uh, in, in the mouth. So yeah, don't brush even after coffee. A lot of people will brush after a beverage that is staining and thinking that that's good for them. Uh, it can actually make your teeth stain more by making them more porous to the next beverage that is staining, has staining potential. Okay, so swish and then wait how long? Half hour, okay. at least, 45 minutes. And when you do brush, how long do you brush for? Can you know when is enough? Right. Uh, well, if you have a $300 toothbrush that's connected to your phone, it will tell you, right? I'm kidding. Don't, don't rely on that. That is, that is a huge mistake. Um, I think in general, uh, two minutes is a, is a fair answer, but I think it, it depends on your technique and uh, how long it takes you to get each of the quadrants and and I think the, the best way to answer that would be to talk to your hygienist, brush in front of them so they can see, A, that you have the muscle memory of brushing all the different areas. And there are lots of areas that we miss and because we just haven't been told that that's an area that we miss. So listen carefully to your hygienist, show them how you brush. They will point out to you what areas you have missed. And then you'll probably have to modify how long it takes you to brush your teeth. I know some people that can brush in under a minute and they do a great job. Some people brush for two minutes and they really should be brushing longer, which doesn't necessarily, that's not the root cause. The root cause is that they haven't brushed properly. They've yeah. overbrushed certain areas and it, it's, a, it's a subconscious activity. I know people that brush while they're watching TV or, or reading or, you know, or they have a, even while they have gum in their mouth. I mean, it's, it's funny how we just kind of go through the, the, the motion of brushing and we really don't focus on brushing. Now, did I actually literally get the, back of that second molar. That's an area that my hygienist told me that's where food gets caught. I mean, you really have to think about it. Yeah. When I'm brushing, I sometimes worry that I'm making my receding gums worse, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do what you said and show my dentist next time how I brush. Good. If you, if you watch movies and TV shows, you'll, when the actor and the actresses are brushing, they, they are not brushing correctly. They need a, they need a different advisor on the set. So let's talk about children's teeth. Um, how does a functional dentist manage cases where a parent is adamant they're doing all the right things, yet mm -hmm. unfortunately their child suddenly needs fillings? Where could they be going wrong? Right, this is a really difficult aspect of, of being a dentist. Uh, parents, first of all, parents are, are very motivated. They, they may have had a history of cavities and. I hear this all the time. In fact, I've seen moms and even dads break down and cry when they are told that their child has their first cavity. It could be even on a, on a baby tooth, but certainly on an adult tooth. Uh, it's a pretty traumatic um, event for them. And, and it, I think it, it goes back to their first time at the dentist. And so parents take it very seriously. What they don't understand is that you can have perfect hygiene the parent's able to get in there and let's say we're talking about a three-year-old and the, the three-year-old allows them to brush and floss even and they do it in a timely way and they're eating well. But if the child is mouth breathing or if they're snacking while the parent is not there like at school um, or at a friend's house, these are things that can negate that perfect hygiene protocol and, and what's going, you know, just that perception that everything is going well. So first I would say the first thing we always do with children in general, especially if they have a lot of cavities or bleeding gums, we look for facial development, make sure that they're able to breathe through their nose properly. And we always ask the parent, please go into your child's room at night for many, many nights and, and always, always, uh, you know, not just for one night, but, and do this over the years and make sure that your child is sleeping deeply and well and not tossing and turning and that the mouth is closed. That is very, very important. A dry mouth uh, from being open all night long, that child, even though they're brushing and flossing and using the best toothpaste out there and eating well, they will get cavities. Uh, that is an unfortunate fact. Um, so it's really, 
it's on an individual basis. It could be that that child cannot breathe through their nose because they have obstructions. Uh, there's some architecture there that didn't develop correctly. Uh, that's typically where I go to first, but it can be diet. And then a lot of parents think that they're, they do have the ideal diet at home and they actually don't. So that's where you have to get into nutritional counseling. You have to tell them that white rice, even brown rice or brown bread as opposed to white bread, there are really no differences when it comes to uh, the carogenic effect, the cavity producing effect of these foods. And that's where I go, always go back to paleo. If you can truly eat a paleo diet at home, which is really difficult to do with kids. I mean, kids have friends that are eating Cheetos and they're gonna come home and they're gonna say, well, mom, that looks like a very healthy product uh, to me. Why aren't we eating that? So it's difficult. For those children who do eat certain foods that aren't paleo, is there anything a parent could do with the, the swishing with water? Would that be a step to help mitigate swishing the damage? Swishing with water, uh, making sure that they brush, but not right after the meal. Uh, how easy is that to do though? I mean, in everyday life, uh, what if they're at school? What if their teacher rewards them with a, a sweet or a candy? I mean, you can't always be there for them, but you can, one trick that works well is to make sure they have a nice water bottle with them and that they swish with water after they eat something. You can't go wrong with that. That really works well. Or give them a cheese stick. You know, tell them, you know, I know you're going to try and do well at school, but if you eat something that you know is on our list of things that we don't want you to eat, just munch on this mozzarella cheese stick. That will help. That will help uh, stabilize the pH in the mouth. Uh, you could have them chew gum, for example. Some schools don't allow that, but but make sure that your child is not mouth breathing. That is a, a big uh, issue in so many different ways, but for cavities, yes, it is. Um, it, it's something very important that every parent needs to know whether their child is mouth breathing or not. One of the things we hear about is the toll a mother's teeth and bones take when she is pregnant. What does pregnancy do to teeth? And is there anything women can do about it to safeguard theirs? That's a really good question. So that's an old wives tale, and, and, but we can't dismiss it as just that because usually wives tales do have some basis for fact. And so a lot of pregnant uh, women, patients, uh, they do, they have teeth issues. Uh, you know, they, they may need dental work uh, in the middle trimester, which I try not to do. I'd rather not do it until they're done breastfeeding. Um, so it's not that the baby sucks the calcium, uh, you know, uh, away from the mom. It's not that. Um, it's typically a, a story of nutrition, poor nutrition, poor prenatal nutrition, not enough K2, low minerals in our diet. Um, so if you were to take K2, A, and D3, have that in your prenatal, take the proper B vitamins, um, you know, this probably typically would not be a problem, but before, you th are you, before you're thinking of conceiving, having a baby, make sure your dental health is optimal because gum disease, uh, if you have a lot of cavities, if you are mouth breathing, uh, for example, um, I mean, all those things can contribute to low birth weight, early term birth, uh, and that's something you don't wanna deal with. And you don't wanna have dentistry while you're pregnant. You wanna try and, even a cleaning if you can, uh, you wanna try and avoid that. So going in with good oral health is a good thing on all fronts for your baby, for yourself. Um, but the baby, the, the fetus does not suck all the calcium out of your bones. If you have good bone health, you're fine. If you're eating well, you're fine. There's enough for both. Um, typically that is, uh, there are some hormonal things that go on of course, but if the mom's healthy, there, there should be no problem. You should not have any loss of tooth structure or decay while you're pregnant. That's not like, it, it's like being a child and expecting to have a cavity. It's not a default setting. Okay. Uh, you mentioned mouth breathing a few times. A few uh, times, yes. <laughs> since researching you and reading your posts about mouth breathing and mouth taping, um, I have begun mouth taping when I go to bed with the specialist strips that you recommended. I want to make clear here to everybody watching and listening, we're not talking about regular sticky tape. Right. And exactly. I was initially quite alarmed at the idea of mouth taping. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of any cases where it turned out to be dangerous or there were adverse side effects? No, never. Um, and I'm not worried about that. Uh, there are some new mouth tapes coming out that don't actually close the mouth off completely. Um, there's a mouth tape. I mean, there are specialized products for this. This is how it's taken off. Um, 
how well it's been accepted. There is a mouth tape now that has a vent in the front. But even unless you're using duct tape and for some reason you're not going to wake up, everyone wakes up if they're suffocating. That is such a primal urge. But let's say you've had a lot to drink or you know, you're sedated. Uh, obviously, you should not be mouth taping because you may, you may suffocate as possible. But I have not seen anything in the literature. Uh, I have many two and three year olds that are mouth taping in my practice. They love it. They tell me that their dreams are even better. They're kinder, nicer, no more nightmares. Uh, they don't wet their beds as much. Adults, uh, what did you think of mouth taping? I'm curious. Well, the first couple of hours felt like it took a little while to get used to. Um, but I quite, I mean, I don't really think much of it. I don't really have much of an opinion. It's, right. It doesn't feel difficult for me to do. Right. I just put it on and then right. wake up. Did you up, have a up. less of a dry mouth in the morning? Did you, was there any difference in your sleep? Were there fewer awake times or awareness of, of being in bed and tossing and turning? I mean, was there any difference? I mean, it's, it's different for everyone. It really boils down to how much of an obstruction you have in that whole airway that, that you know, breathing air through the nose. It can, it can be narrowed here. It can be narrowed inside the sinuses. It, it can narrow at the posterior nasal apertures, which is where all that air goes through the back of the palate down into the, when it joins the throat. Um, if you can't breathe through your nose, then mouth taping won't work. But that's one of the reasons I like mouth taping because we get to that right away. People that are uh, uh, freaked out about mouth taping typically know subconsciously that they have an airway issue that they can't breathe through their nose well. Um, those are also patients that are typically very phobic uh, in the dental chair because we're working in their primary airway or source for air and we're throwing water on the back of their throat, we're putting a rubber dam over their mouth. But if they can breathe through their nose, typically they tend to be better patients because they're able to sit there and withstand all that blockage, partial blockage of the throat, the back of the mouth, because they can breathe through their nose. So, so just mentioning mouth tape and getting, seeing what the reaction is, it tells me a lot. There are some people that are in between. Now, people like you, perhaps, where they've mouth tape and they notice no difference. That means you are sleeping with your mouth closed and you have great nasal patency, and that's wonderful. But people that all of a sudden wake up the next morning and text me and say, oh my God, I feel so much better, they, for some reason, have been breathing through their mouth. And that can affect snoring. It can affect how the air passes the airway, collapse of the airway. It can actually eliminate snoring. It doesn't, it doesn't heal any sleep apnea issues, certainly. But then there's a big group of people that are in a gray zone where they can tape. They're very motivated. They, they want to please me or they want to please someone and they want to make it happen. Uh, they're type A, and, but they toss and turn a lot. Well, the tape may stay on or it may come off for after five, six hours, but that means they can breathe through their nose, but not enough air gets through the nose and they become slightly hypoxic at night and they get a headache in the morning. So it's different for everyone, but I use it as a differential diagnosis, as a tool, but also I tape every night. I feel much better taping. Uh, and if I don't, my mouth falls open for some reason, I get a dry mouth in the morning and that's the last thing I want. That's dysbiosis city. So just for clarification, why is it better to breathe through our nose mm -hmm. rather than our mouth? That's a great question, and I forget to mention that often. Um, our, our noses were designed to do all the breathing, all of it, even during mild exercise. Uh, the mouth is there for emergency breathing. Um, the nose humidifies the air. It warms it. It slows the rate of air going down through the airway into the lungs and back. It, it makes the lungs healthier. A lot of oral bacteria, if they get into the lungs, can cause problems. This is one of the risk factors in COVID. A lot of these bacteria, as I mentioned earlier, oral bacteria are found in many systemic diseases like arthritis, Alzheimer's, we talked about that. So it's better to breathe through your nose because the nose is cleaning it. It's doing a better job of filtering and cleaning. Um, it's, uh, it's warmer air. It's better for the lung microbiome. There is a biome in the lung. Um, we know very little about it, but it's just better in every case. We, we know this because our ancestors did it way better than we did, and they had better faces for it, and they had better lives for it. But people that breathe through their mouth, typically they have a higher respiratory rate. They have a higher cardiac rate. Uh, I can measure this at home with my sleep trackers. Uh, I can measure it on patients. Studies will, will um, uh, explain how this happens. Uh, it has to do with the O2, CO2 mixed in the blood. In dental school, I was told CO2 was toxic and that we had to breathe out properly to expel it. Turns out we need CO2 to allow um, the release of oxygen from hemoglobin from the red blood cell. 
And all of this is worse when you breathe your mouth. Um, mouth breathing was kind of an English thing, I think, for a while. There was an English dentist back in the 1800s that talked about it. And then, of course, the term came from that, you know, that person, if they were, you know, had, had mental issues or, you know, were a criminal, for example, those were, they were all considered to be mouth breathers. In fact, that term was used, oh, he's a mouth breather. Um, and then it kind of got lost for a long time. And that manuscript actually was recently rediscovered by the author of a book that I would recommend for anyone that is interested in knowing more about nose breathing. And that is the book by James Nestor. It was just published. I think it's a bestseller. It's on the bestseller list now. It's called Breath. And that the history of mouth breathing is very interesting. And I think it starts in England. So, so yeah, don't be a mouth breather. <laughs> Uh, try and get that nose back online. 60% uh, of us in this country uh, breathe through our mouth, solely through our mouth, almost always. Uh, we have some kind of obstruction. Uh, there are some people that believe that breathing through the left and right nostril have make differences. One's the sympathetic side, one's the parasympathetic side. I'm, I'm not, I don't know enough about that. That seems a little crazy to me, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't say no to that being possible. Um, and, and present. So nose breathing is very, very important. If, if, if you are a mouth breather, do yourself a favor, do everything you possibly can with your dentist or by reading that book, seeing an ENT, make it so that you can, if it's your child or yourself, make it, make it so that you can breathe your nose properly and fully. It's not an easy journey for, for some. It's difficult to you know, involve surgery sometimes, but it's worth doing. It, it'll improve your, your outlook on life. Uh, it'll make you a happier person. I'm not exaggerating. Um, it, 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 it changes your sympathetic tone, your parasympathetic tone. Uh, all the gurus had it right back two, three, four thousand years ago. Breathing is key to uh, success in life and happiness. In the introduction, I mentioned that you authored the book, The Eight Hour Sleep Paradox. Some people might wonder, what has sleep got to do with dentistry? Uh, great question. Uh, I, first paragraph, uh, the first chapter explains that. Uh, first of all, I, I was a dentist that had sleep apnea, didn't know I had sleep apnea, but really that's the, that's the, the backstory and, and that's an interesting story, but I don't wanna bore you with that. But essentially, this is the important thing. Dentists can recognize sleep apnea decades before a physician can, because we're looking at different aspects. And it has to do with our environment, our food system, big food, um, pesticides, and all of that. We are eating a diet that is preventing us from developing properly. And if we don't, if this face doesn't develop properly by age six, downward growth, width of the face, um, uh, we cannot breathe properly. We start breathing through our mouth. We start waking up in the middle of the night because we don't get enough air. Our airway collapses because it's so narrow due to the facial structure and the bony structures of facial development. And this is a real problem. And it's something that really dentistry has been kind of ignoring. Uh, we get a, a, a lot of facial development, um, academic teaching in dental school, but not the ramifications if something goes wrong. Uh, orthodontics really hasn't treated it that well. We have not addressed it that well. There's a movement out of England uh, called the orthotropic, orthotropic movement, which is, which is pr the proper way to see facial development. And back to your question about, you know, how do I treat kids? One of the, thing I, one of the things I do is I send them to, a, the, prop, to a, the proper thinking orthodontist by between age one and five. I don't wait till age 10 because the face is done developing by age six, most of it. A uh, little a bit of work can be done up until age 10, but that's something that is, is very important. And if, if dentistry can't do it, medicine certainly doesn't have the training. So it's something that we really need to be, we need to make our patients aware of, and that is facial development. It can be lack of breastfeeding or not enough breastfeeding. It can be a tongue tie, which is a midline defect. That's due to the wrong form of vitamin D that we're taking as a prenatal. Uh, these are all factors that prevent us um, uh, chewing on hard foods, pureeing our foods. Uh, I know a lot of parents are worried about their little one choking. Uh, I have a granddaughter who we've been trying to have her chew on meat sticks and chewy things and raw vegetables so that that chewing motion will help develop her face and tongue posture, oral posture. These are all things I'm rambling on. I realize that, but it's a very complicated thing and it's, un, it's under the, it's in the realm of dentistry and we need to address it. So if you don't develop properly, you're going to be a mess later on in life, in other words. And, and 
I didn't develop pro properly. Um, uh, my wife didn't. Uh, my my kids were a little bit better uh, at it because we gave them a lot of K2 and fish oil and all that. But it seems that sleep apnea, most of us have it to some degree. Sleep disorder, breathing, uh, and that's something that is related to dentistry. And sleep apnea is sleep disorder, breathing. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so would that cover snoring as well? It does. In fact, snoring is the early signs that your airway is collapsing. Uh, there's some people that don't snore, but they, they, that airway isn't vibrating. There's no air passing through it. So they, they're actually gasping for air and they're not breathing for 30 to 50 seconds. And then they wake up and then they go back to it. So if you're not snoring, don't see that as a sign that everything's fine. But Snoring is not cute. It's not funny. It is a serious matter, whether it's your child um, uh, or, or your, your uh, sleep partner, uh, you should always make notice, uh, make note and tell that person that they were snoring. Because if, if someone is snoring, they should go see a physician, a dentist, a sleep specialist right away. That's important. Are there things that can be done for snorers though? I, I tend to think it's one of those problems where you just end up having to live with it. Or people think that. Right. Uh, people do think that. Um, I know a lot of dentists that, you know, think that. If you're, if you're snoring, you're just, you, you're a snorer. And that's something you have to deal with. Sleep in a different bed. So you don't, you don't affect your sleep partner, your, your, um, your spouse. So um, it can be fixed and it should be fixed. There are easy fixes. There are some difficult fixes, but it can be fixed. Uh, learning how to breathe through your nose. For example, people that breathe through their nose don't snore as much as people that breathe through their mouth. Mouth taping can fix borderline cases. If you have full-on sleep apnea and your airway is collapsing, you have to have that fixed. Uh, it could be surgery. It could be an oral appliance that keeps the chin from falling back and collapsing the back of the airway, uh, allowing it to collapse more readily. Um, it can be um, losing weight, for example. We gain weight in our airway. We gain, gain weight in our tongue. If all those structures fatten up a little bit. Our airway is smaller. It's more likely to to uh to collapse uh, a lot of women uh, during menopause even perimenopause a lot of those symptoms the, the hot flashes the irritability lack of focus not able to sleep that's all related to sleep apnea uh, progesterone and estrogen are actually uh, hormones that are protective to the airway muscles that's why women catch up with men at, uh, uh, at menopause uh, another terrible thing that women have to endure um, uh, is poor sleep so it's um these are all things that can be addressed. So if you're snoring, fix the snoring. Very important, absolutely. Do not take it lightly, it's not funny. It's not cute. Dr. B, it's time I let you go. Thank oh. you so much for speaking to me. I enjoyed it, thank you. If someone is listening to this and they want to see a dentist with the kind of knowledge and expertise that you have, what should they do? Is there a directory somewhere? There is, we, we've created a directory. We kind of created a problem with Ask the Dentist, our website. Um, we've been telling people about everything that I've been talking about in this hour, and then they realize that they're not getting that at, with their dentist. So we do have a directory, uh, one that actually reaches out to Europe and other parts of the world. We have over 100 dentists in that directory. So if you're looking for a functionally minded dentist, someone that's looking at root cause uh, or root contributors to uh, overall health and that come from the mouth, uh, there is hope. You, you can get this. This is, again, not taught in dental school. So you really have to seek someone out. Uh, for example, if you think you have sleep apnea, um, you know, go see a dentist. A, see a functionally minded dentist. They will, um, they will fast track you and, and they will look at the root cause where, where a physician will just give you a CPAP that blows air into the airway and balloons it out and keeps it open. And that has a lot of ramifications as well. So uh, just go to our website, askthedentist.com. Look for, I think it's search dentist, search for a dentist. Uh, just search for that and you'll see the directory. It's very simple. I will post links to Dr. B's social media and website in the summary text that goes with this video and podcast. Health Hackers viewers and listeners, thank you for being with us. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe for regular videos. And if you're watching or listening on Facebook, Spotify, or Apple, you can opt to follow the show there too. That's it. Bye-bye.